question lane. Solving problems through the process of questions and answers. I would just like to welcome you to the question lane where the goal is to solve problems through the process of questions and answers. Today's guest is Kenneth Montgomery. He is a criminal, civil rights, and personal injury lawyer from the law offices of Kenneth J. Montgomery in Brooklyn, New York. Um, law, also known as the yeah. area, law is going to be something we're going to focus on today for our interview. Uh, specifically okay. suggestions on how to solve problems without creating more. So I would just like to ask you, uh, you know, how would you like for me to refer to you, Mr. Montgomery, Mr. Montgomery, oh, Kenneth? You can, call, you can call me Kenneth. That's fine. Perfect, Kenneth. I'll go with that. So um, is there anything you want us to know about you before we get started? Mm, no, unless you got some questions. I, um, you know, I've been practicing law for 21 years. I teach it. Um, I teach at Fordham Law School and Brooklyn College, former prosecutor. Tried um, a lot of cases in my lifetime, both federal and state, probably around 70 to 80 trials. And, um, you know, I'm here. So whatever you, whatever you want to talk about, I'm game. Perfect, perfect. Why did you become a lawyer and what interested you in becoming a criminal defense attorney? Um, I became a lawyer because at a young age, I was aware of how Malcolm was uh, dissuaded from becoming an attorney. And his teacher told him that, you know, black people essentially don't become attorneys, that he should become a carpenter. And I also was um, very aware of what had happened to our people historically. Um, I didn't know all the facts as a young person, but I knew that something was off. So for me, becoming an attorney, um, in my mind, would, would put me in a position of, of, of power and, and knowing things so that I can be a resource for the community. Why I focused on criminal stuff is because I wanted to be a trial attorney, and that just seemed to be uh, where most of the trials were. So that, that's what led me in that direction. And, and also, you know, it was, it's a place where you, in the criminal side, you're, you're going up against the government, and I, and I, and I, I like that. So that, that's why I chose that path. Perfect, perfect. So when you say Malcolm, just to be clear for the audience, you're talking about Malcolm X, correct? Yeah, yes. I, I read uh, the autobiography at a really, really young age, and um, I, I, it really moved me at a young age, and, and um, that, that's what, that was one of the reasons why I became an attorney. Perfect, perfect. So uh, one of the things I like to focus on for the podcast is words and definitions, mm -hmm. and I know you will have a definite appreciation for this since you are a mm -hmm. criminal lawyer. So. Mm -hmm. One word that I hear a lot is racism. Mm -hmm. Racism, what does that word mean to you? Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that to me helps describe America and Western culture. Um, it's, a, it's a tool for some um, to make sure white supremacy is the rule of law and order in which everyone um, revolves around, and, and, and racism is how it's done, and not just towards black people, but other, other people outside of, the, um, outside of whiteness. I heard a podcast host a while back who gave a definition of racism, and I thought that it was very, very descriptive and pretty accurate, so I just want to see what you have to say about this definition. So... Mm -hmm. When he used the word racism, and I'm talking about um, Gus T. Renegade, he hosts a podcast called The Cows, just for our listeners. Um, mm -hmm. Racism, he uses that word as a synonym with white supremacy. And what he means mm -hmm. by that is racism is a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in a known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you think that is accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. It's hmm. pretty accurate. It's kind of sort of similar to what I just said. Um, yeah, it's a tool to, to maintain a certain order. 
in which the the world uh, revolves, and 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 it, it's it's used every day. It's subtle in some examples, and it's grotesque and overt in others. But it, it's it's definitely uh, a, a way, a, a system that that you know the world seems to follow. Good, good. So another word that I want to focus on is justice. And being a lawyer, I'm always curious to hear what uh, people that work in law, because I don't work in law, obviously, but I'm always curious to see what is their definition of the word justice. Um, <laughs> I think justice is a very uh, subjective, ambiguous term, in my opinion. Um I think that it, it's really depending on who you're talking to, you get a different um, result. And I don't think it's it, it, it's a cliche. It's become a cliche in American uh, jurisprudence, rule of law. In my opinion, it's a cliche. Are you familiar with uh, Neely Fuller Jr.? Absolutely. Okay, uh, Neely Fuller. Nilly Fuller Jr., uh, author of the Compensatory Code System Concept, he has a definition for justice, and his definition is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and then guaranteeing that the persons that need the most help gets the most constructive help. So do you think that mm -hmm. is an accurate definition of justice? I mean, it, in a perfect world, yeah, that is. But when you have a system that's influenced and informed by racism, um, and and uh, inequity, um, justice is, is a very intangible thing to, to lay your hands on. In theory, I think it's absolutely right, but in practice, I, I, I don't think it, 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 it works out that way. Okay. I think people have to define their own justice before you start going to the American legal system to figure out justice. Hmm. So one of the things that uh, I'm on the younger side, so I wasn't taught this in school, the concept of the Dred Scott decision, and uh, yeah. it took me going to college and after college for me to understand what this uh, concept was about. Can you briefly explain what the Dred Scott decision was? Dred Scott is the case, uh, Sanderford is actually the, the, the full name of it, but the Dred Scott decision is probably – in my opinion, the most important Supreme Court decision ever laid out for several reasons, particularly in how uh, black people are, are treated in the United States. Um, it, it basically was the, the, the decision was written by a, a Supreme Court justice named Roger B. Taney, and he essentially said that um, that the white man – that the, a black man has no um, no rights that a white is obliged to respect, um, and that decision really lays out our relationship to America, our relationship to capitalism in America, our relationship to the law in America, um, and and it really sets uh, sets. A, a, um, a precedent as to how we are treated in this in this country. So even in 2019, when you have these decisions uh, by the Supreme Court concerning gerrymandering, when you have a debate when that next black person is killed by police, when you have predatory lending, when you have all these different issues. To me, it really stems from what is in the heart and soul of this country when it relates to black people. And in that decision, it sets the standard, which is that we're not human. And they don't have to, they don't have to respect us. And, and, and I think since that decision, you know, the facts show that people may disagree with Taney, but he was absolutely right as far as how America would treat us. So... What do you think is the biggest problem that black people face in this country as of today? Um, it's a lot. I think um, we don't control our ecosystem. We don't control our leadership. We don't control our political 
ascension in this country. We don't control our socialization, our economics, and most importantly, we don't educate our children. And when you don't educate your children and you don't control your ecosystem, um, you are in the way and on the wrong end of most of these American policies that we deal with every day. And even when you look at the leadership, what is our le- look at our leadership. What is our leadership? Al Sharpton, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, um, Jesse Jackson. Um, where, where, what is our leadership? Oprah, uh, Jay-Z, the, the recent labeled uh, billionaire entertainer, uh, LeBron, Cowie. Like, what is, what is our leadership? What is our cultural default? We have none. Um, we, we've become a part of the American spectacle. But most, the most dangerous part is that we don't control our education. Yeah, I, def- I definitely agree with that. Education is a very important factor when it comes to developing the minds of the youth and helping them to solve problems because, uh, yep. um, I would say for me the biggest problem is, like you said, just not being in control. That's just a simple way that I would explain it to a five-year-old, not being in control. <laughs> Not being in control. We 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 don't control Period. our our any, anything in our community is beyond our control, and we don't teach our children. Perfect. So perfect. you know, there's no black nationalism in this country. Hmm. How can you not be national black and and think nationalistically and think you're going to have a way to control your child's future? Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed the content, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Stay up to date for more videos by clicking the bell notification icon and following our social media. For any of the people, groups, companies, or videos that were referenced in this video, don't forget to check the description and or the pinned comment section. The question lane, solving problems through the process of questions and answers.